Hi everyone, welcome to the Earth Science Regents Review podcast series created by Hammocks Middle School Earth Science Department. Today we're going to talk about shape of the Earth. Well, in order to understand the Earth, we actually have to bring the Earth into the classroom by using something called a model. Now models are going to be something, really anything, that's going to help us understand the Earth. Visual models or tactile models can be globes, they can be animations, they can be videos. You can have mathematical models like formulas, you can use graphical models. Anything that's going to help you understand the complexity of our planet is going to be considered what we call a model. Now the Earth is quite complex. It has multiple layers to it, multiple sections that interact with each other on a constant basis. That's what we call Earth's spheres. Now the rock portion is called the lithosphere, the gas portion is the atmosphere, the water portion is the hydrosphere, the ice portion is going to be the cryosphere, and the living portion is what we call the biosphere. And those spheres are constantly interacting with each other each and every day. Now, the Earth wasn't always believed to be round. There was a significant period of time that believed, that a lot of people believed, that the Earth was flat. So we do have some evidences here that do support the idea that the Earth is not flat, that the Earth does actually have a spherical shape to it. And the first is from space photos from the Hubble Space Telescope, the Apollo missions, whatever it may be, by far the number one evidence that the Earth is some sort of a spherical shape. The second piece of evidence is called the sinking ship theory. And this is kind of antiquated, but back in the early years of navigation, there was the idea that the Earth was flat, that ships would appear to reach the horizon and appear to fall off the edge of the planet, and they would never come back. Well, it wasn't until navigation and boats started to become more technologically advanced that these ships still appeared to sink at the horizon, but they were coming back. The only reason why they appeared to sink at the horizon was simply because at the horizon, that's the end of our line of sight. That's when the curvature of the planet starts taking over. Boats weren't really sinking at the horizon. They were just following the curvature of the planet. So that sinking ship theory basically took the idea that the Earth was flat and converted it to the idea that the Earth actually is spherical in nature. The third idea here is what we call the altitude of Polaris. And the great thing about the altitude of Polaris is that not only does it give us the idea that the Earth is spherical in nature, it also helps you determine location on the planet. Ancient astronomers and ancient sailors figured that by using the stars they can navigate across the northern hemisphere. They figured out that the angle above the horizon for Polaris, called the altitude, is equal to the latitude that you're going to be on. So if you could find Polaris and figure out the altitude above the horizon, you had an idea about the latitude that you were going to be on. Now, it didn't give you exact location, but it would still give you an idea about roughly where you could be found somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, Polaris is important to us because Polaris directly lines up with our North Pole, lines up with the Northern Axis. So that's going to be the idea that the Northern Axis points to Polaris. Once you can find that star, you can help navigate across the Northern Hemisphere. Now, Polaris is going to be the only star in the nighttime sky that's not going to move. The rest of your stars are going to travel around Polaris in a counterclockwise direction. Now, the important thing here is being able to find it. So if you can find the Big Dipper, you find the two front stars of the Big Dipper, they will always point to Polaris. Polaris is the last star in the handle of the Little Dipper, so it's quite easy to find. Once you find that star, then you can use your instrument called an astrolabe to figure out the angle from the horizon up to the star. Once you figure that out, you can figure out the latitude that you're going to be on. So for instance, we have the little person right on the equator. The dotted line represents their line of sight, or which basically represents the horizon. Polaris's light comes down on that person, but is right along the horizon. There is no angle, relatively no angle, between the horizon and Polaris's light. So Polaris's light is essentially going to be zero degrees above the horizon. If your light is zero degrees above the horizon, that means that you're at zero degrees latitude or the equator. So our little guy here is going to see Polaris right along the horizon, okay, maybe just above the water's edge there. So that would be synonymous with a person at the equator. person at the North Pole, it's a little bit different. Again, there's a line of sight which represents the horizon. The starlight from Polaris is going to come down on top of them at a 90 degree angle. If the altitude of Polaris is 90 degrees, that must mean that they're at a 90 degree north latitude, which means that that person would be at the North Pole. So here's our man viewing up at Polaris, which is going to be a 90 degree angle, so it's also going to identify the latitude that you're on, which is 90 degrees north. 
So not only does altitude of Polaris equal latitude that you're on, it also gives us an idea that the Earth is spherical. Because if the Earth was flat, every location on the planet would have an altitude of Polaris of 90 degrees. From one coast to the next in the United States or around the world, if we had a flat planet, Polaris is far enough away where it would give us about a 90 degree altitude everywhere on the planet. And that's not the case. Every single location in the Northern Hemisphere has a different altitude of Polaris, which means you have a different latitude you can be on. Now the star's path across the sky, including the sun, are always going to take a curved path. If we have a spherical planet, then we're going to have spherical paths or curved paths for our stars and our sun across the sky. You see the sun's path in winter and in summer here. They are not straight. They have a curved nature to them. Then the last piece here is going to be lunar eclipses. Anything spherical in nature is going to produce a curved shadow. So whenever the full moon passes into the Earth's shadow, the curved shadow of the Earth is going to be cast upon the lit portion of the moon. So you can see the curved nature to the shadow there provides evidence that the Earth is somewhat spherical in nature. Now there are two shapes that we go by with the Earth. The true shape is what the Earth actually is. And that's what we call an oblate spheroid. An oblate spheroid just means that the poles are squished and the equator bulges. That's due to the fact that the Earth rotates on its axis, centrifugal force pushes out at the equator, which causes it to bulge. That's the actual true shape of the Earth. Now that picture that just flew by is a highly exaggerated picture. So it's very important to have an idea that you have to get the squished poles and the bulging equator. Now you also have what the, what's called the apparent shape, or what the Earth appears to look like. It appears to look like a perfect sphere. So very, very important to know the differences between a blade spheroid, which is the true shape, and a perfect sphere, which is the apparent shape, what the Earth appears to look like. Now there's certain models that we go by here. Now models are going to be perfectly round and perfectly smooth. So think of any object that might be perfectly round and perfectly smooth. We go by the terms something that's going to be drawn to scale or something that's a scale model. Like a ping pong ball or a billiard ball are really good examples of scale models that might be of the Earth. Think about these objects. If you blow them up to the size of the Earth, they're still going to look perfectly round and perfectly smooth. You see a photograph of the Earth. You don't really see the high, high mountains on the Earth and even see the low, low trenches of the Earth. It looks perfectly round and perfectly smooth. So billiard balls are a good example of a model for Earth and so are your ping pong balls as well. So those are two examples that tend to pop up quite a bit on the Regents exam. Now, gravity measurements support the idea that the Earth is somewhat oblate in nature because you tend to weigh a little bit more at the North Pole and the South Pole because you tend to be closer to the center of the planet. You tend to weigh a little bit less at the equator because you tend to be a little bit farther away from the center of the Earth. So the center of the Earth is where our gravity comes from. The closer you are to that center of gravity, the more you're going to weigh. The farther away you weigh from that center of the planet, the less you're going to weigh, only by a fraction of a pound. So when you talk about the distance from North Pole to South Pole, that's a little bit smaller than the distance around the equator, which supports the idea that the Earth is somewhat oblate in nature. So you can see I have Mr. Red and I have Mr. Blue here. Mr. Red's going to weigh a little bit more because he's technically closer to the center of the planet. Mr. Blue is going to weigh a little bit less. He looks a little bit slimmer because he's technically a little bit farther away from the center of the planet, away from that gravitational attraction. So with that being said, that's it for the shape of the Earth, and uh, good luck on your next quiz or test.